Fall das nächste Punkt zu den Punkten. Ja, first I would like to thank the organizers for inviting me to give this talk here at the Strings Conference. So the title of my talk is D-Brain Instantons and Supersymmetric Four-Dimensional String Vacuum. So it's about string phenomenology in some sense. So first statement is in order to make progress towards making definite predictions uh, from string theory for low energy physics, of course, as we all know, we must resolve the issue of modelized stabilization. And we know of two effects which can do this. More recent one, we have seen that fluxes uh, induce uh, scalar potentials which can freeze part of the moduli. And in some sense, these fluxes define the background, of course, and in this sense, they are tunable. And then there are non perturbative effects coming from instantons of various sorts or Gaugino condensates. And, but these are not tunable, you know. If you define your background, these things are there and you have to take them into account. So the program we started, so to say, in our group in Munich and also here in Madrid, is a systematic investigation of string instanton effects for various classes of n equals 1, and emphasize n equals 1 string vacuum. So most of the work so far you can find in the literature, I think it's fair to say that they are either for virtual instantons in type 2 or hydraulic string and for M-brain instantons. And there are many works, so I didn't cite anything, so it, anything is missing here, please excuse me. Um, so the program is, for this talk is, so first I would like to, to, to state what we're actually doing, so to study D-brain instantons effect in N equals 1 four dimensional, four dimensional, uh, four, four N equals 1 4-dimensional action. I will tell you about the zero mode structure and possible liftings of these fermionic and bosonic zero modes. Then I will propose sort of a CFT instanton calculus for doing explicit uh, instanton computations using conformal field theory. Then I will discuss E2 instanton corrections to holomorphic objects in the theory, like the superpotential or the gauge kinetic function. I will shortly discuss instanton effects on D terms, which are of course related to the issue of brain stability. And as being the main motivation actually for our work was to, to study instanton effects in realistic D-brain string vacuum as intersecting D-brains, for instance, or magnetized D-brains and type 2B or hydraulic strings. So first of all, these instantons can generate closed and open string superpotential terms, and by this lead to adding KKLT to modular stabilization, or as has also been discussed recently, to inflation. But what we found, so to say, is that it can also generate perturbatively forbidden but phenomenologically desirable matter couplings, like, for instance, Majorana masses for neutrinos or Yukawa couplings, which are absent perturbatively in the, in the string vacuum. So these are the leading order terms, then, because perturbatively they are forbidden, and in this sense they are important to know about them. And a sort of an application is that we tried also to give a stringy derivation of known field theory instanton effects and generalizations thereof. So this is the program. I will see how far I can get. So first of, no, first of all, just a reminder, we have to, in all these type 2 uh, D-brain constructions, the Green-Schwartz mechanism plays a very important role. So if we have realized stacks of D-brains with various kinds of UN gauge factors, for instance, there always appears these U1 gauge factors as being part of it. And in general, these U1s are anomalous gauge symmetries. So anomaly cancellation uh, is taken care of by the four-dimensional generalized Green-Schwartz mechanism. And by this, these U1s, first they become massive, but nevertheless, in the perturbative string, they survive as global perturbative symmetries. So all your correlation functions, which you can compute perturbatively, they still preserve these U1 selection rules. And usually only one requires only that specific linear combinations stay massless, as for instance, the one one would like to have, like the hypercharge, for instance. So as I said, these global U1s forbid some desirable couplings, for these semi-realistic models, like Majorana type neutrino masses or SU5 Yukawa couplings or new terms. But it's not clear. I mean, usually, if, if you think about M theory, the uplift of, say, if you have a type 2A intersecting D-brain model to M theory, these U1s are generally not present. And so you can have couplings which break these U1s. So this is sort of a puzzle. And so these couplings are there on G2 manifolds. So how can they be generated for type 2A or antifolds? So as I said, so instanton corrections in string theory are known to break the axionic shift symmetries, which play a prominent role in the Green-Schwartz mechanism. And therefore they can break, of course, the global U1 symmetries. So these are the things we should look at. And there were these two papers uh, last year, more or less in parallel, and what we considered there is the two brain instantons, which I call E2, Euclidean brains, so which wrap internal cycles of the Calabayon manifold which we compactify, in this case, these are three cycles. 
and we require them to be supersymmetric, so they have to wrap special algorithm three cycles on our Calabi-Yau manifold. Yeah? And then we can just study, because these are D-brains, so the D-brains, we can have all these D-brain technology applied now to the instanton calculus here. And we can just look at zero modes, so massless strings, massless open strings, and the quantized strings, and then we find that from E2, E2 open strings, generically, as Uncle already mentioned, we find four bosonic zero modes. So these are the position of the instantons in the four-dimensional flat space, and four fermionic zero modes, which we call theta, alpha, and theta uh, bar, alpha dot. Yeah? And if these instantons allow for deformations, so if the, the first Betty number of this free cycle is non-zero, we get additional zero modes, which come from the deformations. So these are complex bosonic zero modes for each deformation, and again, four fermionic zero modes, which we call mu in the following. Okay, but because we generally would like to generate F terms, so where we only have two general fermionic zero modes, the teters, so we have to get rid of these teter bar zero modes first. So one way to do this is to place the instanton in a in very omega invariant position so that precisely, if we arrange it correctly, precisely these two things are modded out and only the teter alpha survive. And the condition for this to happen is that this instanton must be placed in, in a position such that the this, the x mu zero mode survive, and these are, as you can see, O1 instantons. Yeah? So on the gauge theory, on the instanton, you get a O1 uh, gauge group. And the other cases are SP2, if the orientable projection works in the other way, or if it doesn't work at all, maps it to something else, then we have U1 instantons. And this has been pointed out in these papers, the distinction between these different kinds of zero modes here. Another way to absorb these two teters here is by placing, I mean, the reason here is that we place the instanton in the bulk of the Calabi-Yau. So, and there, it breaks the supersymmetry of the bulk, which breaks, which means it breaks eight supercharges down to four supercharges. But if you put a D-brain, so to say, under the E2 brain, so that it, uh, in the internal part, lies on top of the, of the D6 brain, for instance, then we can also get rid of these two theta zero modes by diagrams like this, diagrams like this. Yeah? This has been studied in a nice paper by Billow et al. already in 2002, and it was shown that by integrating out now these theta bar from these correlators, you get, for instance, the fermionic ADHM constraints for free. The same holds for the bosonic ones as well. Um, so another thing you might envision to do is to use D-brain, uh, well, E-brain now, instanton recombination. Right? So that we put the E2 and the, we have the primed uh, image, omega image of the instanton, which so far still preserves four of these theta, theta bar zero modes. And then we do some sort of instanton recombination. And here I just give you some preliminary result of a paper to appear, to, be a, to appear soon. So if this intersection here is chiral, so that you get some states in the symmetric or anti-symmetric representation of the gauge group on the E2 instanton, after recombination, the resulting object indeed does not have these theta bar zero modes, but additional fermionic zero modes must appear, just for charge conversation. And this spoils the generation of an F term for such instantons. If the intersection is non-chiral, so that you have, say, positive intersection number plus, and M plus one and the other one also plus one, then after recombination, again, this thing is to get rid of is soaked up, but we are still left with some additional zero modes, M and V bar, which can be understood as coming from deformation, uh, deformations of the instanton. And these are the same zero modes as have been studied by Beasley and Witten for the heterotic case, where they can generate multifermion couplings. Another thing you might envision is to, to break supersymmetry in the bulk by turning on fluxes. And this we have studied um, for E3 instantons, because here the fluxes are under much better control. So we considered these sort of orientifolds here, which have mostly been considered in this case. And now we'd like to turn on a primitive G2 form flux. But then one can see that this does not lift the theta bar zero modes. They can lift these deformation zero modes, but not the theta bars for the U1 instantons. Okay, so we have a couple of negative results. So it seems that the best thing to do is to have an O1 instanton. Then you can be sure that um, all these, these additional zero modes here are not there. Okay, so this is the instanton action. Any non-perturbative correction goes with exponential of the instanton action. And it has the volume of the instanton and the coupling to the raman raman form here. But now it's not gauge invariant because these things here transform due to the Wigan Schwarz me mechanism under the U1 gauge symmetries supported on the D6 brains. And one can see that if you do the transformation, that it 
transform the phase, and the phase is precisely the current intersection number of the, of the three cycle of the instanton and of the three cycles of the D6 brain and its image. Uh, so it has a topological interpretation. And the consequence is, um, if this charge is non-zero for some A, no naked, if you want, naked superpotential contributions like this, just un with uncharged fields, are possible. The only thing you can do and is to dress it with additional matter fields, which are also charged under these U1 symmetries. And then you can generate couplings which are invariant under the U1s, such that precisely the charge is add up to zero. And this is, so to say, the microscopic reason of this non-perturbative breakdown of the global U1 symmetries. No? So if you just look at the coupling, this thing by itself, forget about this thing here, does not preserve the global U1. So how can we understand the selection rule of the fermionic zero modes here microscopically? We just derived it from the Green-Schwartz mechanism. Yeah? So, so far I didn't, I only talked to, told you about the, the zero modes coming from the open strings, coming stretching from the E2 instanton to itself. But there are other open strings in the game. There are open strings from the instanton to all the D6 brains, which are in the model. And these have Dirichlet Dirich Neumann boundary conditions in the four-dimensional flat space. And this immediately tells you that there can only be fermionic zero modes in this case, if you're not sitting at the singularity. Because bosonic zero modes, potential bosonic zero modes are already heavy. You know? So there are fermionic zero modes in this case. So these are what are also sometimes called Garnaut strings. It was pointed out by Garnaut in this paper from 96. And if you do the exercise, you find a couple of these things just from the intersections of the E2 brain with all the D6 brains in the game. And if you add up the U1 charge here of all these zero modes, you, you find precisely this factor I showed you before. So, so let's say the the charge hidden in this e to the minus instanton action term comes from these, fermionic zero, these charged fermionic zero modes supported on the intersection of the instanton with its explained. Okay, so as I said, E2 instantons are described by open strings, so everything is, is are D brains, yeah? And so we can, should be able to compute string instanton amplitudes just from boundary conformal field theory. As has also been proposed by Good Pelle Green or applied to by Good Pelle and Green when they compute this R to the four terms, for instance, and by Below et al. So, as a first step, just a modest step, we would like to compute rigid, so without any deformation, E2 instanton contributions to the charged matter superpotential of this form. Yeah. So, here's the formula. I had th unfortunately, I don't have the time to explain it in detail, so just state the result. What we what we derived in this uh, first paper of ours. So we propose the superpotential by a correlator, so a multi uh, matter field correlator in the instanton background. So because we're doing CFT, these are not canonically normalized, so we get these scalar potential factors here in front of it. So this thing is the holomorphic piece we are interested in. And our proposal is that in order to compute this instanton correlator, of course, as usual, you integrate over all the zero modes you have. These are the general ones. These are the matter field zero modes. And then you have various factors here. So first you have the exponential of the instanton action. So this is exponential of, of the vacuum disk amplitude. Then you have the exponential of the vacuum one loop amplitude, usually called the Fafian here. And then you can absorb, pull down, so to say, various, uh, <coughs> these operators down from the action by putting them on a disk and you put precisely two of these matter field zero modes on the disk. This is the way you absorb these, uh, these matter fields here. And you absorb these zero modes, sorry. And generate couplings for the matter fields here. And you can also do it with, with loop diagrams, but then you, are, you can just put the matter fields on the loop diagram, but not the, not the, not the uh, charged matter zero modes. For this correlator, of course, there are higher corrections, higher loop, but only the claim is that, of course, they don't contribute to the holomorphic piece. The holomorphic piece is determined uh, by the leading order and by the one-loop term. Okay? So, let me... So, we have disk diagrams and we also have loop diagrams. And for the loop diagrams, as I said, so it's the factor of the vacuum loops. So, the loop diagram is, again, it's just an open string partition function between the instantonic brain and the D6 brain. So, it's given a usual trace formula, like here and likewise for, for the Möbius strip amplitude. But first notice, this thing vanishes just due to supersymmetry, E2, E2, uh, due to both the degeneracy. But these things, as we have already seen, are not both the degenerate because they are more fermionic zero modes than bosonic ones, so they are non-vanishing. And so we exponentiate them, so this is, so say, we can factor them off, and this 
claim is this or just the famous one which determines everybody who writes down? Yeah. And how to compute these things? So we found that yeah, diagrammatically, in these two papers here, diagrammatically, we have the relation that it's the same. We can either do we have the identity between uh, a vacuum annulus amplitude between an E2 brain and a D6 brain. It's equal to the statement for even spin structures to the threshold correction. If we place instead here a D6 brain on the same internal cycle and compute the threshold correction, this one loop threshold correction for the gauge copying on this brain here, that's coming from the other brain here, it's the same thing. Yeah? So they are related to threshold corrections. Open problem, which we, I'm not sure how to compute these things, what happens for the old spin structures in this case? Uh, there you would expect that you find something like a one loop correction uh, to, to, the, to the theta angle here. Okay. Uh, okay, so, this, so to determine these one loop amplitudes, we just have to compute the threshold corrections, which has hardly already been done for certain cases. And it's known from old work by Schiffman Weinstein and Kaplanowski Lewis. Uh, that these one loop amplitudes you compute in string theory, they are not polymorphic by themselves because you haven't integrated out, so to say, the massless mode. I mean, you still have the massless modes which you should keep in the theory. You have also integrated all the massless modes. So, and it's, it's some work is needed in order to extract the holomorphic Wilsonian part of these, get, of these threshold corrections. As I said, they are non holomorphic contributions. And here's the formula. So you know that these stringy threshold corrections contain this holomorphic one loop piece and some corrections coming including uh, uh, the killer potential of your theory, right? And the same formula now holds just with another interpretation also for, for the E2, D6 partition function. And if you compute these numbers for this case, including the various annulus and mibus amplitude, you find this formula here. Uh, so these are the beta function coefficients, the mass of spheres. And if you put then everything together, also that the CFT disk amplitudes combine non-holomorphic scalar potentials here and holomorphic pieces coming from the square potential, you find that this holomorphic thing you are interested in yeah, can be extracted or can be expressed entirely in terms of holomorphic quantities and this is what you expect. Right? So, so higher loop corrections to this uh, amplitude only contribute to corrections to the killer potential. Okay, now I come to applications. Just a couple of remarks. So a couple of applications. So how much, how much time do I have? Six. Six? Good. So I'll speed up a bit. So for E2 instantons with no matter field zero modes, so we just have the teeter and possible deformations maybe, uh, there can be corrections to the uncharged closed and open string moduli superpotential, like in what is think, thought about in KKLT. Right? So you're undoing everything for E2 instantons. You can, by T-duality, immediately transfer to type 2B instantons. So in the type 2A case, the instanton action here does not depend on T modulus, as you might. I used to maybe from the KKLT scenario, but to the complex structure moduli. And the one-loop determinant here depends on the Kähler moduli, also in an exponential way, by the way, from virtual instantons, and also in an exponential way on the, on the D6 brain moduli, which I called uh, delta here. And these in superpotentials, which as again, they are there. You cannot simply turn them off or turn them on. They are there. So you have to be, you have to be, they have to be computed and then included yeah, in the discussion. They can lead to vacuum destabilization in the worst case. Or if you have other sources here in the superpotential, as has been discussed by KKLT, they can also lead to stabilization of closed string moduli or maybe open string moduli. And in particular, this open string modulus has also been used for inflation. Or in particular, this potential here has been applied for application in the KKLMMT scenario. Maybe I missed some uh, letter. Okay, another application, more important for us here, is that for appropriate E2 instantons, when you have these fermionic zero modes, you can generate perturbatively excluded matter couplings. And these are important couplings for phenomenology, like for instance Majorana masses, which are known to be absent in most of these sort of um, intersecting these six brain models, for instance. And there has been some work on these issues, also some nice phenomenological application recently. So the idea is that you can soak up the zero mode, if you have just the right number, by putting down two uh, of these neutrino fields, no right-handed neutrino fields. And then you have a coefficient in front of them, and it's, uh, it has a mass, yeah? so it's, it's, it's a mass scale, so it's related to the string scale, and then has this, ex because it's a number perturbative effect, so it has this exponential suppression here, but it only tells you that it's small relative to a mass. Yeah? 
So the natural scale here is I'm asked the string scale. So if the string scale is high, we can still get moderate neut right-handed neutrino masses of I don't know, 10, 10 to the 14 GeV, for instance, which is in the range you would like to have them. So it's a new mechanism to generate these neutrino masses and to explain a small hierarchy between the string scale and the neutrino mass scale. Another thing is SU4 IQ carpet couplings. This was more or less the killer for all <laughs> over the years for, for all these intersecting model, intersecting these six brain models with SU5 gauge symmetry, where you realize the antisymmetric representation by open strings coming from a stack of brain to its image brain. This is, for instance, a concrete model. Not concrete, I mean, if you have if there's two kinds of, of D6 brains, A and B, with this sort of intersections, and these just chosen to be three, so we have no concrete model in this case, it's just a general idea, uh, then you can realize an SU5 gut model, right? And here you have some, some, some hexes. But if you look at the SU1 charges, you find that perturbatively, you get only these two sort of you cover couplings. So this guy is missing here, perturbatively. It should be present on G2 manifolds, so how can this be? because here it's not U1 invariant. And so if you have now an instanton, or one instanton, with this sort of intersections with these two kinds of brains, D6 brains, uh, which are appearing in the model, then you can soak them up. You can soak up this overall six, because, I mean, here you have already five brains on top of each other to have this SU5. So overall you get six fermionic zero modes. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four, five, and six. And you can absorb precisely these zero modes by pulling down precisely these 10, 10, and 5 Higgs coupling here. So these couplings here, which, by the way, include this epsilon tensor, by which it's already clear that it has to be generated non perturbatively in string theory, are generated, in fact, for intersecting deep brain models. Okay, so for flipped SU5, it looks nicer, actually, because, of course, you expect, because these are non perturbative you expect these couplings to be smaller than the perturbative ones, and for the flipped SU5, the D quarks, D, S, and B quarks uh, are, in, are in the 10 representation. So you have, in some sense, the hierarchy between the DSB and the U, C, and T quarks are, are given by E2 instantons, and the flavor hierarchy between the various intersections here are given by weighted instantons. You can explain. As another application or formalism, we were trying very moderately just to reproduce one of the N equals 1 uh, SQCD Affleckdein Cybex superpotential for number of flavors equal to NC minus 1. And we engineered a local model to do this, so sort of a quiver diagram where we also included the instanton and put the instanton right on top, of course, of the color brains in order to be interpreted as a gauge instanton. And then we looked at various conformal field theory disk diagrams which can soak up all the zero modes. I don't have the time to go into very much detail. So the fermionic ones, they were soaked up by, by this amplitudes here, the bosonic ones by this four-point amplitude, and we computed the contact term in CFT of these amplitudes here. The ADHM constraints, so to say, come for, come, for free, come for free, in this case from the effective theory on the E2 brain. And then we did all the computation, and we eventually arrived at something which really looks like the affleck time superpotential with the right determinant factor in the denominator. It's not so clear to us, and which we are thinking about now, is whether there are, can expect higher alpha prime corrections in the story. By higher alpha prime, I mean higher powers of phi, not really stringy effects, but higher powers of phi. This is what we are looking at now. And similar computations, generalization of this, have been done in two recent papers by these two Italian groups here. Uh, two minutes? Two minutes? Take a couple more minutes. Yeah? Good. Uh, so finally, I would like to discuss instanton corrections to the gauge kinetic function. First of all, for D6 brains, holomorphy dictates that the gauge kinetic function, uh, the holomorphic gauge kinetic function must look like this. So the tree level kinetic function is just a linear, term, a, 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 a linear function uh, of the complex structure moduli. And there's a one loop correction, which can, is not allowed due to Petri consumetry and holomorphy to depend on you, but and only depends in an exponential way on the Keller moduli, so only world sheet instantons contribute here. And then there can, in principle, be non perturbative corrections non-perturbative in the string coupling. So U, U contains here the string coupling. It's because like there's a one over GS. So U, U controls the, the string expansion. Yeah. And there can also be non-perturbative couplings. And these are the guys we are after. So for intersecting the six brains on T6, which is quite concrete, the holomorphic one loop gate threshold corrections have been discussed in these two papers. And if you extract the holomorphic part for N equals one sectors, they vanish. And for N equals two sectors, it's this famous factor of Ln of the eta function of the killer moduli. Just as a reminder. 
Okay, so if you look at this literature and look for the world sheet instanton corrections to this thing, to these guys here, yeah, so then you find that they come from world sheets with two boundaries in this case. So annually, annually, yeah. As for instance, in this case, for n equals two sectors. So what you sort of expect then is that these E2, if you map them by S and T duality to E2 instantons, then you expect that non-rigid E2 instantons contribute to the gauge critical function. And precisely the ones that have one deformation. Yeah? And this is the ones we are looking at now. First of all, one has to distinguish two, two different kinds of these zero modes. First one is when to distinguish them how they behave under the anti-holomorphic involution, which is part of your orientative for projection. It can be invariant or anti-invariant. And this determines what kind of modes are modded out under the orientative for projection. There are two cases. The first case, the why the bosonic zero mode survives, and then also, so to say, an anti chiral field, if you want, survives, the bar. And if it's minus sign here, then the, the bosonic mode is modded out, and the, the chiral one will survive. And this is the same zero mode structure, by the way, as has been studied again by Beasley and Whitney for world sheet instantons. So these are the world sheet instantons transforming in a family, and these zero modes come from the genus of the, of the, of the curve that the world sheet instantons are wrapping around. So here we find the same structure. You know? And in, in, in this case, these guys were the ones which contribute to the gauge kinetic function. And these are the guys which contribute uh, to this higher Fermi couplings. And we find the same results just by looking at the zero modes. So now we're looking at an instanton wrapping a three cycle with one deformation and no additional, and no additional zero modes, no, addition, no, no matter zero modes. Then um, a, a, a correction to the gauge kinetic function, so we would have to compute such a two-point function here, can be generated from this simple diagram here. So this would be the formula again, uh, disk, uh, disk uh, vacuum amplitude, uh, one loop vacuum amplitude, and then this correlator here where we absorb the zero modes, so the two teters here which we still have, and then these uh, mu zero modes so from coming from the deformation. In this case, we have no bosonic ones. Let me put two Fs here. And we were just looking at, you know, at the charges that everything works out, at the world sheet charges. So in principle, this diagram could be there. We see no reason why it should not be there. No? And if it's the case, then of course, if we have an instanton correction to the gauge kinetic function for these intersecting brains. So last piece. Give me one more minute. Oh, good. Uh, usually, it's known that corrections to the gauge kinetic function come hand in hand with corrections to the Fayulopoulos term. The Fayulopoulos term, in this case, on intersecting the six brain is the integral. Uh, it's essentially yeah, it's the integral over the three cycle that the six brain is wrapping the imaginary part of the holomorphic three form. No? So if this thing vanishes, so then classically supersymmetry is preserved. Then it has been shown in this paper by Lawrence and McGreevy that then also at one loop no Fayulopoulos terms are generated. Yeah? So if you are supersymmetric at three level, you are supersymmetric at one loop. But what we are asking the question now, what, but what if we just break supersymmetry by a D term on say the brain B and then look onto the effect of a brain A, a one loop effect on the brain A. And then we find it's non-zero. In fact, you find a relation that the, the one loop generated Fayulopoulos term on the brain A is equal or proportional to the tree level breaking, so the Fayulopoulos term, tree level, the tree level Fayulopoulos term on the brain B times the gauge kinetic function, times the threshold correction. So we are doing CFT here. So times the one loop gauge threshold correction. This is the one loop threshold correction. So again, there seems to be a nice interplay between corrections to the Fayulopoulos term and the gauge kinetic function. So this is more an observation. And if this is there, then we also expect the structure we found for, for the gauge kinetic function that there can be instanton corrections, we also expect E2 instanton corrections to the Fayulopoulos terms. And this is, of course, very important for understanding stability of D-brains. For type 2B, this would give sort of, say, uh, an instanton, D-brain instanton corrections to the pi stability condition, so studied by Douglas and others. So conclusions, it's essentially what I've shown you already, which was the outline of my talk, so we have studied D-brain instanton effects in n equals one four-dimensional action. We have used open string methods to study the zero mode structure and possible liftings, proposed a CFT instanton calculus, studied E2 instanton corrections to holomorphic objects like the superpotential and to gauge kinetic function, made a proposal for instanton corrections for D terms that they are there, it's so important for brain stability, pointed out instanton effects are important for realistic D-brain string vacuum not only for stabilizing closed string moduli and for inflation, but also for generating 
perturbatively forbidden but phenomenologically desirable matter couplings like Majorana masses for neutrinos, Yukawa couplings for SU5 models, or mass terms for exotic matter, or even more, which we haven't thought about yet. Thank you. Questions? Okay. If not, let's thank our speaker once more. Yeah. Our final speaker this afternoon is Bert Schellekens from Amsterdam. He'll be telling us about